Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a great week and as excited to be here as I am. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Allison Leahy, and I'm the community manager at Ning. I'm here with Crystal Coleman and Juana Hampton from the Ning team, and Richard Millington, the founder of Fever Bee, an online community consultancy. He's also the author of Buzzing Communities, How to Build Better Active Online Communities. And he is your presenter this hour on the topic of the online community life cycle. So welcome to Ning's community management talk series. There's a good chance you've joined us before, but for those who are new to Ning Talks, I'll just go over a few of our housekeeping rules. We will be live tweeting the event and encourage you to share any comments, quotables, and questions using the hashtag Ning Talk. So that's hashtag N-I-N-G-T-A-L-K. If your question is over 140 characters, go ahead and submit it using the questions feature in GoToWebinar. You can submit as many questions as you like during the course of the presentation, and we'll be saving some time at the end to share and discuss these questions with Richard. The online community life cycle is Richard's 11th webinar for Ning. We broke into the double digits two weeks ago when uh, Richard presented on the topic of influencing community members. To watch the recording of that presentation or any previous lecture, you can head to cultivate.ning.com and select the Community Management Talks tab. You'll find topics relevant to communities in every stage of the life cycle from conceptualization through mitosis. And if you are a Ning customer, we also have another exciting offer for you today, and that's access to a community course by Fever, Fe Fever B. This is a condensed version of the professional community management course that boasts alumni from social business powerhouses such as Amazon.com, Greenpeace, Wikipedia, and Autodesk, among others. And trust me, it's awesome. I've read through each lesson a couple times and learned something new with every read. So I'll make sure you get a link to the course as well as the community management talks I just mentioned. And I'd like to give a warm welcome and hearty hello to all the community loving folks out there. Thank you again for carving a little time out of your day to be with us. Remember the hashtag for today's presentation is Ning Talk and the topic, the online community life cycle. Without further ado, here's Richard Millington. Thanks for that introduction. Did you just say all the community loving folks out there? Yeah, I just assume we're all community lovers. <laughs> It's kind of a strange phrase, isn't it? Community loving folks. <laughs> it is. Okay, let's do this. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us again. And thank you, Alison, for that uh, very kind and optimized introduction this time. So today we're going to be talking about community strategy and the community life cycle. These two things are very much linked. The strategy for your community is based upon where you're at in the community life cycle. I'm barely, if I asked a lot of people that are on this webinar now, if they had a plan to increase the size of their community, or to increase the level of growth in their community, or to increase the sense of community that people felt with one another, most people wouldn't have an answer. There are a lot of people out there that respond to what's happening in their community, but without any strategy or without any plan to improve their communities. A lot of the organizations that we work with have people that are very good at responding to what's happening in their community, but they don't have anyone there that can proactively increase the number of people that are participating in that community and proactively increase the size of that community. So what we want to do today is explain how you know what to work on next how you know where you are in the community life cycle, and then how to plan a strategy to go where you have to go next. So the strategy is based upon three components. The first one is your data. Data will tell you where you are now. Without data, you're pretty much working in the dark. Without data, you don't really know how your community is doing. Without data, you might be missing some very big issues in your community. So for example, we've worked with organizations in the past where the client might be worried that members are often fighting with one another, 
or worried about one minor change to the website. But when we actually look at this community, when we do a full analysis of what's going on in that community, we might find, for example, that for every thousand people that join the community, only two or three are still active six, six months later. And this is a really big issue. But it's also an unseen issue. If you don't track your data, then you miss really obvious things like this. So it's very important that you are tracking your data and you know where your community is now. The second part of this is the theory. Theory, and by theory we mean the proven social sciences behind how communities develop. This is what we're mostly going to be covering in this um, lesson today. What we want to go through today is outline how communities develop. And they develop upon or along very fixed, rigid paths. A community doesn't just explode into life. One of the biggest mistakes that a lot of organizations make is that they try to go for a really big launch. They try to get thousands of members to join the community very quickly. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work because relationships take more time to develop than this. So what we need is to understand how communities develop. What are the stages that a community goes through? Some of this should be familiar to most of you already. But what we're going to do today is go through the entire thing. And the third part of this is the action plan. So how you link where you are now to where you need to go next. So it's one thing knowing where you need to go next, but you have to know how you're going to get there. What are the very specific tactics? So for example, what are you going to say to whom? That's going to help you get your community to where it needs to be. What we want by the end of today's webinar is for you to know exactly how you can increase the size of your community, how you can increase level of growth, the level of activity in your community, and how perhaps you can also increase the sense of community. The interesting thing about online communities is that there isn't a single agreed life cycle, and people use different models to try and understand what the life cycle is. So a lot of people have tried to use the Bruce Tucker model in the past of group dynamics, where there's a forming, storming, norming, and performing stage. And this sounds like it should make sense, but this only works if you have a static audience, not if you have members that are joining and leaving all the time. A better model is this one by two academics, uh, Iribari and Leroy. So they looked at all the literature that was available in online communities back in 2009, I believe. And they came up with four definite stages to the community, or five if you include the death of the community. The stages were inception, creation, growth, and maturity. But the issue with this is that there's no fixed metrics to it. It's also very focused on the launch of the community and not what happens when the community begins to grow past that launch. So what we've done is taken the existing academic data that's out there now, taken the proven science around how communities develop, and tried to make everything a bit clearer for everybody. So online communities generally develop through four set stages, or five if you want to include the conceptualization stage, which we covered recently. Communities begin in the inception stage. This is where the community manager initiates most of the growth and activity that you see in the community. This stage begins when you launch the community platform to members and ends when more than 50% of growth and activity in that community is generated by the community at which point you move to the establishment stage of the community life cycle. This begins when you've hit that 50% mark and ends when more than 90% or when, ends when 90 of the growth and activity in that community is being generated by the community and you have, have a limited sense of community there. That means that members will have a limited sense of familiarity with other members in that community. You'll be able to notice and see references to previous things that have, that have happened in the community. Members will begin to have an understanding of what to expect from each other in that community. The third stage is the maturity stage. Most of the successful online communities that we see are in the maturity stage, which often leads to a common misconception that most communities are in the maturity stage. This is only true if we, if we take into account the success bias. We generally only hear about the communities that are a success and don't realize that for every community that gets to this maturity stage, there are many communities that fail along the way. And one of the reasons they do that is that they see a, a community in the maturity stage, 
they see how big and how active it is, they see how, how many members are participating, and think to get to that stage, they need to have a lot, a lot of members in that community. When generally they don't understand that every big online community began as a small online community. And to get to the maturity stage, you have to go through these stages here. So this stage begins when 90% of growth and activity is generated by the community, as opposed to you, the network creator or the community manager. And you also have a strong sense of community. And finally, you have the mitosis stage. Not every community will reach this stage. This is a stage when the community begins to split into smaller subgroups or into separate communities entirely. This stage is generally where each sub-community begins back in that inception stage and you have to grow and facilitate each of those groups. And this life cycle is incredibly important because it tells you exactly what you should be working on at any particular time. So what we did last week was that we looked at the conceptualization of, um, of a community. So we looked at what the community is about, who we would target to join that community, what type of community this will be, what is the goal of the community, and what happened within this community. And what you get from this is a list of members that you can reach out to straight away, a lot of existing relationships, so you know exactly who to target when you launch. And what you do in the inception stage is try and take these initial members and invite a steady number of members to join every day until you reach that critical mass, the point of where more than 50% of growth and activity is initiated by the community. So this means you have to do very specific things. It means that you have to focus upon a relatively small group. There is no point in inviting more and more members to join if you can't convert the members you have into active members of that community. All you're doing then is wasting the potential of the members that might have been active. In the early stages of a community, you need to make sure you get a high amount of activity from a relatively small number of members which means you focus on what we call the micro-level tasks. It means you focus on the one-to-one -one tasks, directly inter interacting with members. This means that you individually invite people to join the community, one at a time. It means that you build relationships with every person that joins the, commu the community. Because initially, a lot of those early members in the community will participate because of a commitment to you, instead of a commitment to the cause or the nature of the community. This is really important because one of the biggest ways that you can improve the chances of your community being a success is to build a lot of relationships with your target audience before you launch the community. We noticed this about three years ago. We noticed that when we were interviewing a lot of people for a ebook we were writing, the people that succeeded in launching a community always said that the very first members that they invited were people they already had existing relationships with. And we found then that if we could get our clients simply to have stronger and more existing relationships before they launched the community, their chances of, of succeeding were far, far higher than trying to launch a community and then get people to participate. So before you even launch the community, you should have a lot of existing relationships there. In the inception stage, you should also be initiating interesting discussions. We covered this in a previous le lesson, and maybe Alison can send the link through um, at some point during this, web this webinar today. This generally means that you are talking to your target audience and you're identifying what their biggest challenges are, what their hopes and fears are, what their aspirations are, and where they hope to be in the future, and initiating discussions around those topics. We want to make sure that members, when they join the community, they can participate in what we call a self-disclosure discussion. That means a discussion where they can reveal something about themselves, about their experiences, about something that they've done in the past. Just reveal some information about themselves that they then see reciprocated by other members. There's a very careful balancing act in the early days of a community, where you have to balance the discussions that convey information and the content that conveys information, with the content that encourages people to get to know each other, with the content and discussions that satisfy a member's social needs. So for example, if you ask a question as, what is the best way to resolve a certain issue? Or how did you tackle a, cer a certain issue? That's a very good type of, 
of, of, of discussion to launch a community with, especially when you have good relationships with this audience, where you know a lot of people have solved that issue and a lot of people have struggled with that issue in the past. The other thing you're going to have to do at this stage is prompt members to respond to discussions. This is more difficult than, than it seems. What you find in the very early stages of a community is that it's easy to launch a community, it's relatively easy to get people to join, it's very simple to initiate discussions, but to get people to actively participate, and listen, at least until participating in that community becomes a habit, takes far, far longer. And that usually means you have to individually reach out to them and prompt them to respond. It means you have to specifically ask for their expertise or their experience on that issue. And what we've actually found is asking members in that exact way, asking them exactly for their expertise, using the word expertise or using the word experience, tends to get a far bigger response than just asking members to participate. And at this stage, there will be no tactics that you need to use to get members to develop a sense of community. That comes next. So what you should see happening here is an increasing number of members joining without you prompting them. Eventually, word will begin to spread about your community. You'll see it mentioned on social media platforms. You'll see content that's being shared. You'll see discussions that are being shared. You'll see that it just gets mentioned within that topic, and, in, and an increasing number of members join without you prompting them. But until that happens, you're going to have to be out there and individually inviting people to join every day. Usually, that means inviting five to 10 members to join every day. You can hope that people stumble across the community and join, but in reality, that doesn't happen. The second thing you'll see is an increasing number of discussions initiated by members. So in the very early stages, you'll be initiating every discussion in that community. But over time, you'll find that more and more members feel comfortable initiating di um, discussions themselves. And one of the things you can do is reach out to a few of your members, ask them what are the biggest challenges that, that, uh, that they face, and then when they tell you, invite them to post that as a discussion in the community. Because once again, it's a habit of doing that, and once other members see other members posting those discussions, far more, likely, uh, far, far more people are likely to do it as well. So you see these discussions beginning to take off just by themselves. The other thing you'll notice about inception stage communities is that they have as few features as possible. So if you look at the East Dulwich Forum, for example, when they launched their community, they launched it with as few features as possible. They really slimmed it down. So all the activity generally takes place in the same place. That's why it's a good idea to start with no subgroups or anything else. This is a community that we've recently launched um, for, com for, for community experts. And what you see on the left-hand side is that the level of activity at this stage is generally quite low. And you'll see that I and a few others are posting a lot of their discussions. But gradually, more and more people are participating and responding to, uh, to those discussions. So you generally see that the discussions begin to take off. One of the things you want to be careful of here is that the community looks like it's active. So what we do, for example, if we post a discussion that after a day or so doesn't get much of a response, we remove the discussion because we don't want newcomers coming there and seeing that the community looks empty. So we tend to focus on the discussions that are working and the discussions that are popular, rather than trying to make sure that every discussion is a, is a success. And one of the other things that we tend to do very early on is to establish experts within that community, highlight some of the key people within that community very early on, so instantly there are stars in the community that other people want to emulate, that other people want to contribute their expertise so they can be featured as a profile as well. What you don't want is a situation just like this where you launch a very big community that looks incredibly empty. You don't want to have a lot of features when you launched. Most communities, when they launch, look a little bit like this. You'll see here that Mike W initiated for a long time every discussion himself. And every discussion was getting very few responses, but he was there pushing it and, and it was ticking over until it reached a stage where other people felt comfortable initiating discussions as well. The hardest part of launching a community is getting that community off the ground, getting members to participate. Not getting members to join, but getting members to participate. And that often means you have to push through for a long time, maybe a couple of months, 
of you posting discussions, prompting people to join, and feeling like it's not taken off until it does take off. You don't want a situation like this. So in a situation like this for this community, you'd want to remove the discussions that generally aren't working and focus on the, on the, on the discussions that are working. If someone launches a discussion in your community, perhaps you want to promote that or nudge other members to participate. Because at this stage, every single new post you get in your community is a big win for you. And you need to build up a series of wins every single week. So a couple of things at this stage. One, don't let the, pla the, 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 the uh, platform appear empty. Make sure that there isn't any dead activity. Make sure there, that there aren't any redundant areas within that community. Two, make sure that you're driving activity. Not just posting activity, but proactively driving that activity. Initiate the discussions around topics you know people are passionate about, and then prompt people to participate. Focus on getting a large amount of activity from a relatively small number of members. That means you have to individually interact with them. You have to build strong relationship with them. And what we do is set aside a specific time where you can do that every single week, perhaps Friday afternoon, perhaps Friday evening, or Monday morning, or whenever. But we set aside a time specifically to do this. And what we actually do for our clients is that we track this. We track every single person, just like we would a sales funnel, where did we reach out to them? Did they respond? What did they say? So we know instantly where every single member is at in that relationship development process. So individually building those relationships is what's going to lead to a lot of activity from them. So a lot of the things that lead to a community success in the inception stage takes place behind the scenes of the community itself. So that individual outreach, those nudges that they, you give to members to participate are so incredibly important in the community's long-term success. So once a community has reached that critical mass point, your tasks begin to shift. And this is why it's really important that you get this right. Because you shouldn't be doing the same thing in the community every single year. Your role should evolve with, uh, with the community. So while, you're, so while you were initially working at the micro stage, micro interactions, those one-to-one -one interactions, you gradually, once you hit critical mass, and I do mean gradually, move to the macro stage. So you don't drop everything in the left-hand column here to move to the right. You slowly evolve your, your role to focus on activities that affect more members at once. And this is where you can see all the other things that we've covered in the last 10 or 11 webinars all begin to make sense. Because you know in the inception stage, if you have a community where more than 50% of growth and activity isn't generated by, by the community, you need to focus on these four or five really specific tasks, and that's almost it. But if you reach that stage, then, then you can focus on a broader number of tasks. You have that base from which your community can grow. So that means writing content about the community. Not just writing content for the community about the topic, the best knowledge, but it means writing content about the community, interviewing and profiling the key members that are in your community summarizing what's happening in, in, in a community, organizing regular events and activities for the community. You might begin recruiting and training some volunteers to write regular guest columns or run parts of the community or just take responsibility for moderating different topics. You might also spend more time collecting and analyzing data in the community here. And at this point, if you refer back to the webinars we did on growth, you might also want to look at referral growth tactics. So perhaps publishing and ebook on a particular topic or issue that people have. And even if there isn't a community of, of practice, it works for any type of community. So we've had a support-based community, for example, where everyone shared their most outstanding story about a certain health um, issue that they face. And a community of interest can do this as well, as well. a community about a hobby where everyone can share their story about how they became interested in, in that topic, Everyone can share their story or their best memory about that topic or what they like best or their favorite episode of, of a TV show. And it's pretty easy to say this as a big ebook that that you publish on behalf of the community. Because everyone that's everyone that's featured in this is likely to share it with everyone that they know. So that's just one example of a number of referral growth tactics you can do here. But what you should begin to see at this stage is more and more of your members coming through, uh, through, through channels that aren't you. 
This doesn't mean that you should be inviting less and less. It means that you should be inviting the same number of members to join every day so you have a reliable number of new members, a reliable source of new members. But you should also see more and more members coming by referral channels. And this is also the point where you begin to work on your sense of community elements. So here you want to be looking at developing a community constitution or agreeing a shared purpose or immediate goals for, for the community. You might want to be documenting the community's history here. Not just a really standard boring history, the community was created in blah, 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 blah. You don't want that. What you want is an epic history that says the community was created to solve this goal, the founding members were these members, so these were the key discussions that took place. You can create a really interesting epic history that involves the members of your community here. You might also want to be looking at other things that we've covered before in the sense of community elements. And next you'll begin to take a more traditional moderation role which means not just initiating and sustaining discussions, which you will certainly have to keep doing, but removing the bad stuff in the community as well. That means removing the destructive um, material that's posted in the community, or removing the destructive members in the community. Hopefully that won't happen too often, but it's definitely something that you'll be facing. But again, to be really clear here, this is a gradual shift from the inception stage to the that to the establishment stage, a gradual shift from the micro tasks to the macro level tasks. So what you should see here is sustained growth and engagement. You should see on a pretty simple chart, if you're tracking this, that 90% of growth and activity is now initiated by members towards the end. You should begin to see examples of a sense of community developing amongst your members. Not just your core 10 or 12 members that you launch with, but a broader number of members as well. Sometimes you can track this and there's a sense of community survey that you can do as well, or that you can get your members to do rather. But if, if you can't do that, then at least you should, you should see references to previous things that have happened in the community, references by, by members to other members in the community. It should begin to feel like a slightly friendlier community. You should begin to feel in, in, in your heart, I guess, a stronger sense of community begin, uh, beginning to form here. So this means the number of tasks that you do will, bro will broaden at this stage. So you have to balance your time really carefully. So you'll still be inviting people to join the community as you gradually shift. You'll be implementing word of mouth tactics. You'll be embedding scaling processes within your community as well, such as recruiting volunteers to join the community. Or if you're getting regular questions about the same topic, having an FAQ in your community that covers these topics, there's a variety of scaling processes that you can initiate in your community. You'll begin writing content about the community. You'll begin looking to concentrate or dissipate activity. So if you have too much activity within a very small area, that can lead to information overload. It doesn't happen that often, but it's possible which means that you need to find subgroups within that community that you can build a specific group for. So if a lot of members come from a specific area or often talk about a specific topic, you can create a subgroup specifically for this group that tackles the specific um, situations and the issues that, that they face, and then you can promote and launch that group. At this stage, you also want to be highlighting the popular stuff. You want members to feel that they've been through shared experiences together. And that means they have to know what other members are doing. And the best way of doing that is highlighting what's popular in your community. If you're not easily able to do that by, by technology, then simply make something a sticky thread perhaps. Perhaps just write a content piece about what's happening in your community and send it out as a newsletter. But you want to highlight the popular stuff. You want every member in your community participating in, in, in the popular things that take place in your community. As we covered before, you want those regular events and activities. You perhaps want a shared constitution at this stage. You want to be developing a community history that evolves and writing content about the community. Developing who or building stars within your community. The people that are contributing the best, people that have the best expertise. So if your community is in the establishment stage of the life cycle, if between 50% of growth and activity is, gen is generated by, by, by the community, you need to be working on these tasks here. 
And what you should see is high levels of referral growth and the discussions to become almost entirely self-sustaining. By the end here, you shouldn't have to be initiating that many uh, discussions yourself because members should naturally be doing it. And then you should also see a sense of familiarity and shared history amongst members. So the Rock and Roll Tribe, it's an example that I use a lot just because I've seen them grow from the very early stages when, when they launched to the success that they are now. And they're a great uh, Ning, like Ning platform, and I like how they design the site and how they're using the site. Um, the British Heart Foundation, for example. So next we want to look at the maturity stage of the life cycle. So your goal if your community is in the establishment stage is to move to the maturity stage. One of the other things worth pointing out here is that you can't focus on a single metric to advance from one stage to the next. A mistake that a lot of community managers make is that they focus solely upon the number of members they have in their community and not the number of activity that they're getting from those members or not the number of those members that are active within the community. So you have to balance these three things. You have to balance the number of members with the activity per member and the sense of community that your members feel. Because if any one of them isn't doing well, then you can't advance to the next stage of the life cycle. It's gonna hold, it's gonna hold, hold you back. You can keep pushing or inviting more and more people to join the community, but if the level of activity per member is going down, that's a very bad thing, and it's gonna spell the death of your community over the long term. So once you've reached that 90% mark, once you've reached the point where more than 90% of growth and activity is being generated by the community, your community enters their maturity stage. And here your role evolves again, from the macro stage of the life cycle to optimization. So this means where you start taking a broader role, where you have embedded certain scaling process, where you have a, vo a volunteer team, and you look to see how you can optimize the different parts of your site. So here you're focusing upon the work that matters most. So this will mean that you optimize the social density. And the social density is what we've covered before, is the number of members that are participating within each given area of the community. So you remove the redundant areas, you create specific places for what members are doing already. So if lots of members are sharing pictures in a certain area, you might want to create a specific place in the community for that. If members are regularly sharing their top tip about a specific issue, then you might want to create a top tip section of your community. These are relatively simple, easy things to do. You might also at this stage want to start steering the direction of the community. Communities, especially certain types of communities, have a tendency to eat themselves. So communities for freelancers, for example, tend not to do that well because most of their discussions are about how to get work and that gets stale relatively quickly. So what you need to be doing is steering a community to make sure that it's focusing upon what's new in your topic, what's established in your topic, what's the most fun part of your topic. And that might mean tweaking what appears at, right at the top of the page, tweaking what you make a sticky thread, and deciding very deliberately who and what in your community you're going to use your content and your newsletter and the other assets you have and to give attention to. So you can give attention and, high, and, high, and highlight the things that you want to encourage within your community. Find what's happening well already and build it up so more people begin doing it. In the maturity stage, you might also want to be ensuring that the community is influential within its broader sector. So what Mumsnet, a community for mums in the UK, does incredibly well is that they launch campaigns within the sector, they interview the top people, um, in, in that sector, the top mums in the UK, the, um, the, the, the celebrities, even the Prime Minister of the UK. You want to make your community influential within a sector. And that might mean doing certain standard PR work, reaching out to publications and telling them about the interesting stuff that your community is doing. It might mean issuing uh, statements on behalf of the community about different topics that your community feels strongly about. At this stage, you also begin spending a lot of time managing the volunteer team. As a community grows, especially in the maturity stage, and especially if you're looking at a community where you're going to have several thousand people participating, you're going to need volunteers to help you manage that activity, to make sure that the level of activity per member doesn't de decline, as it does in most communities. Here you might also want to be optimizing the newcomer to regular conversion ratio. 
This means looking at your community, looking at where people are dropping out in that process. Do they visit but not join? Do they join but not participate? Do they participate but not keep participating after a couple, um, after a couple of months? Where exactly do members drop out in that conversion funnel? And we've covered this in a previous webinar. And looking to make specific tweaks and specific interventions here to optimize this ratio. You might also want to be optimizing different areas of the platform as well. So by this we mean looking at the positioning and the copy and, uh, and perhaps e even the design of the platform as well, to making sure that it's as useful to the community as possible. Just a quick reminder here that the best community platforms aren't those that look the best, they're those that perform their role most efficiently. And very often those two can be very different things. And finally, you want to be making sure you have, you have established an overall goal and vision for, for the community. What does the community want to achieve? That might just be getting the latest news first, being the most fun place for its topic, or something similar like that. It might be creating the most comprehensive body of knowledge for, for that topic, or attracting the biggest geeks in that topic. But there should be a specific goal for that community that makes your community stand out. So if your community is in the maturity stage, these are the sorts of things you want to be focusing on. So the objective of the stage is to make the community almost entirely self-sustaining. To make sure that you're spending your time optimizing what's happening in that community, rather than driving and pushing everything all the time. If you're doing the same role that you were doing a year ago or two years ago, then it means because you haven't developed the community from one stage of the life cycle to the next, or you haven't evolved with your community. You only evolve your role with the community. So at this stage, you want to reach that point where 99% or more broken activity is initiated by, by your members, not by you. You want to have and feel a very strong um, community identity and sense of community amongst your audience. And you're going to have to slowly shift from those macro tasks to the optimization tasks. So there's a lots of very successful online communities that we can use, for example. Um, Mums, as I pointed out, they do a lot of camp campaigns. And one of the things that campaigns achieve for them is that it gets them a lot of publicity. It generates a lot of, atten a lot of attention from their field. And it makes members feel a very strong sense of community. They feel like they're working on something together, something for the better of, um, for, for, uh, for, for the better of their topic. And finally, it generates a lot of activity from existing members. Members have something that they can be involved in, something that they can follow, something they can contribute to. And that's a very powerful thing. So finally, we have the mitosis stage. So this is when the community becomes too popular for its own good. And that might sound like a very strange term. How can the community be too, too popular? Well, it can be too popular where it's impossible for members to feel like they can influence their community when information overload becomes a big issue in that community. When too many people are participating in a community, not everyone can feel like they can influence a community. And if people don't feel like they can influence a community, and there's lots of social science um, studies to back this up, they stop participating in that community. So it's very important all the time that every member feel like they can influence a community. And not every member will be able to, but every member needs to feel like they could, if they wanted to, influence that community. So that means you have to deliberately break your community down into smaller subgroups or separate communities in, in, entirely. So a friend of mine runs a community called Cointalk, which is cointalk.com for people, for people that love old coins. And I also noticed that a lot of people were talking about stamps as well, and the level of activity was getting very high in that community. So it created an entirely separate community for, for people that love stamps. So it's done a very great job at finding an existing topic within that, within that niche, or that niche, as you say, in the USA, and building a place for that. So in the mitosis stage, you want to be identifying these potential subgroups in your community. Look for member demographics that they share, look for habits or things that they do, perhaps certain job roles, or look for their site or their psychographics, the things that they think or feel about, di about different topics. Perhaps you want to create a working group in your community to solve one particular issue, or perhaps you want to do something else to, to debate one particular issue. 
But identifying and creating these subgroups is going to be very important for the long-term success of a lot of communities. If your community has reached that maturity stage and it's hit the top of, 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 where, of where it can be in terms of growth and activity, then mitosis is the next step. But it's a very scary step because it means breaking apart your communities to some extent. And it also means you have to be training and motivating and managing volunteers to run these groups. You can't just create a group and hope that it runs itself. You have to find someone that's popular to run that group and then work with them to make that group a success. And you shouldn't be launching lots of groups at once. You want to promote and support each of these subgroups. So your, your goal at this stage is to rebuild the community around subgroups. Not to completely destroy it, but to gradually form more and more subgroups within that community. And you want each of these groups to achieve critical mass within a couple of months. And you, there should be a stronger sense of community as a result. Because then every member feels like they can have an impact within a smaller group. Every member feels like they know more people within that group. There's a much stronger sense of feeling and familiarity amongst your target audience. And you want to be balancing the existing community work with the new community work. So if you look at, say, um, scienceforums.com or science.com, I can't remember what the name of the site is, you'll see that they've developed a number of subgroups within the science field. And for the really popular topics, you'll see biology, for, for example, has a lot more subgroups than chemistry. And mathematics has more subgroups than some of the other topics here. So they've developed a lot of subgroups within each of the topics so everyone can feel like they can have influence within a specific group. The student rooms uh, based here in the UK has developed a lot of subgroups within their community around particular topics that people are most interested in where everyone feels like they can have an influence. So now we've covered the basics of a community strategy. The challenge next is to turn this into tactics or an action plan that you can implement to improve your community. So by now, you should know exactly what you should be doing. And so what we use, we use the community framework for this. So all the elements of managing a community are within this framework here. So community management, management is essentially eight different tasks. One is strategy, which is collecting data, analyzing data, selling the, the, the objective for the community, and ensuring a, accountability. The second is growing the community and converting newcomers into active members. The third is moderating the community, so removing the bad stuff and encouraging people to participate. The fourth is having regular events and activities within that community, making sure that you have regular activities that people can participate in. Not just discussions, but perhaps live events, um, webinars, or, so, or something along, that, along those lines. Next is relationship development, or as we can better call it, influence. Making sure that you can influence the, the community and influencing the direction of that community. Making sure that you're either an influential member yourself through your own participation or making sure that you're building relationships with the most influential members in that community. The next one is, con is con content. That means creating content about the community and creating content for the community. After that, for some of you, it will be business integration and proving there's a positive return on investment. And finally, the, the user experience, which is a technology side, optimizing the technology and making sure that everything in that community works as it's supposed to. So what you'll see is that the amount of time you spend on each activity varies as you progress through the community lifecycle. So whereas in the inception stage, you spend a lot of your time on growth, as you advance to maturity, you spend far, far less time trying to grow the community and more, more time trying to manage or moderate the level of growth that you have. So you can essentially multiply the number of hours that you have to manage your community. Perhaps for some of you, it's a full-time role, and perhaps for the rest of you, it's a hobby that you do. You can multiply the number of hours by each of these percentages and have a fairly good idea of how much time you should spend on each activity. And this is a good baseline to work from because then you know how much time to spend on each activity. You can put in specific tasks uh, beneath that. So a calendar for, say, a full-time commu commu community manager might look a little bit like this. So very early on, you begin by doing the proactive tasks. So that would be writing content about the community that's interesting, updating the community history. 
Then it might be inviting people to join the community and converting these newcomers into regular members of the community. After lunch, you might be planning and initiating regular events and activities. And then it's only later in the day that you start doing the reactive work. So moderating things that are happening in the community. And then finally, building relationships up with the key people in that community. Having a repetitive day, if you're a full-time community manager, is generally a good thing. If you're not, then you still need to have a regular plan of what you intend to achieve in each day. If you only have one hour a day, then focus on the proactive tasks first. Make sure you can get something meaningful done that develops a community. If all you're doing is participating in, in discussions and responding to discussions in, in, in your community, that's going to keep the community the way it is now. It's not going to improve the community later on. So even if you're just doing this part-time, part it's important that you do the proactive work first. It's really difficult to stress how important this is. Because if you do the reactive work first, as most, community, as most community managers do every single day, the community never develops beyond where it is now. So it's very important that you do the proactive work in your community first before you do anything reactive in that community. So the action points from the webinar today, um, and I've been talking for a long time. First, determine where you are in the community life cycle. Are you in the inception stage, the establishment stage, the maturity stage, or the mitosis stage? I can, you, you can determine that by looking at levels of growth and activity and the sense of community in your community. Second, identify, based upon where you are in that life cycle, the actions that you need to take and where you need to go next. So you might find, for example, that you have very high levels of referral growth, but most of the activity is still, gen is still generated by, by you. So you know that you need to spend more time on getting more activity going than just on growth. So you can see what elements are missing that will take you to the next stage in that life cycle. Third, break down the actions that you're going to take by each day. So if you've got a project management background, this will really help. If you don't, then literally just make a list of the tasks that you're going to do on each day and do the proactive tasks first. So that's inviting members to join the community, creating content, prompting people to participate. These are all tasks that develop the community, not just maintain the community. So do these before you do the reactive tasks, like participating and responding to, to, uh, to members that are in your community. So as Alison mentioned, we have a free course that we're running now just for you guys. We also have a comprehensive course that we're launching on September the 30th, which you might also be interested in at course.t3.com. And if you have any questions, now's the time. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, Richard. That was a fantastic webinar. I really dug deep there and I can see it resonated with a lot of folks um, attending today. Um, and as a result, we have a lot of great questions. So I'll start with Katie Heath. She asks, how would you suggest following up with members who have said they will contribute, then never follow through? How can a moderator engage with them to demonstrate it's valuable to do so? <laughs> I love this question so much. So we, pretty much every organization we, we work with, we've spoken to a few of their target audience to ask um, them if they will participate in a, in a community and explain the idea of, a, um, of the community in really noble terms. It's going to change the profession, it's where you can get free advice. And everyone says yes. And everyone says yes because they don't have to do anything at that time. They don't have to commit to anything. And the far better question to ask at that stage isn't would you like to participate? But more specific questions like, what articles would you like to participate? How much time can you spend in the community? Will you be one of the founding members of the community? Because these put people in a commitment mindset. Everyone that has ever been approached to join a community, I think, especially a community of, of uh, practice, will say that they're too busy. And of course they're too busy because they don't know what the priority of the community is yet. So instead of approaching people to join a community or perhaps just nudging them to participate, there are, ways, there are ways to do that in really clever ways. So for example, in the community that we just launched, we want lots of the academics um, behind virtual communities and people that have really studied these social sciences participating. But every single one of them says that they're too busy. 
So we'll begin asking them if they want to be interviewed for, uh, for the community. And we'll make sure that interview gets a good response. So we'll begin asking them if they want to write a single guest column or by appealing to different motivations such as, would you like to be one of the expert advi advisors in the community? Which is a role that we just made up because we know it's going to trigger certain motivations that will get people to participate. So if there's being a lot of members, as it sounds like from this question, who have said that they will contribute but they don't, it's because you have to be a little, little more specific than that and you have to structure their initial contribution in a way that benefits them. So you have to appeal for those different motivational needs, which is going to be self-efficacy, where they can have a big impact within that field, where it's going to be what we call positive distinctiveness, where people can create and maintain a positive reputation by sharing their advice and expertise in some way. So the very words and the very language that you use, so actually using the word expertise and experience usually gets a good response. Oh, it's going to be aff um, affiliation, so making friends and finding a sense of belonging within that community. So if we call a community a very exclusive community, for example, we're only letting the best people in, suddenly everyone wants to join that community. And if we say we're going to remove the people that aren't, that aren't, that aren't participating, then you might find that the level of participation in, uh, increases as well. Um, so there's a variety of tactics that you can use, but you just have to make sure that you're phrasing the question that you ask them or the thing that you ask them to do in a way that aligns with their motivation. I hope that makes sense. Nice, definitely. Um... I especially like the idea of creating new roles. You can get creative with titles there um, and speak directly to the folks you're inviting to the community. Um, to follow up on that, Michelle says that you mentioned within the inception phase, you should ask five to 10 members to join the community a day. Is it smart or relevant to call upon the existing community and explicitly ask them to invite new members so that the community can grow and become more valuable for everyone? Sometimes that's a great idea, but then you don't really have control of whether they're doing it. And usually when you tell people to invite their friends, they don't do it because they have no motivation to do it it's far easier to host a really interesting event and tell the community members that they can only invite one like one person that they know to join that webinar or that event with some sort of password or something like that. Because then everyone is motivated to do it because they have something scarce that they can share, something that can impress their friends. So just simply telling members to invite their friends doesn't usually get a good response. It might, but it doesn't usually. But it's far more reliable to, um, to do it yourself. One of the things that you can do that works especially well is asking members to, uh, to list who are the best people that they know in the field, who has the most expertise, who is the person that would really contribute a lot to the, to the community, and getting them to give you a list. So when you reach out to these people, you can say, hey, Joe said you were an expert in this field, and we would love to have your expertise on a specific issue. Do you know how to solve it? Because at the moment, no one in our, com in our community can. So then it's a very specific m message that tackles their a very clear motivation. It's aligned with that motivation that, hey, I can make a big difference here. This is going to be um, a community where I'm seeing as the expert. So people are motivated to join that community. So perhaps not asking members to invite their friends, but asking members to tell you who they, th who they think should be joining the community can work incredibly well. Love that idea. Um, and to follow up, kind of, um, there were a few questions about content and activity in a community. Um, so I'll just start with Katie's again. Uh, she asks, are there buzzword types of questions which tend to work better to stimulate discussion in a community? Are there buzzword type questions? I'm not quite sure I understand that. Are there buzzword? What I think she, she's asking is that are there specific things that you can use that will get people to participate or, or respond, I guess. So, yeah, there are certain things that we've seen work well. So very early on in the community, we tend to ask people, what's the biggest problem or the biggest challenge that you're facing right now? And everyone is, is usually quite happy to answer that because when they answer that, 
then they can see what everyone else is struggling with and very often a lot of people are struggling with the same thing. And then we can also work with members to help solve those issues and members can work together to solve those issues for other members. So it tends to create a lot of specific things that work very well. Um, asking members about their career aspirations or their goals within the topic, how they first became interested in, um, in, in that topic um, also tends to work quite well. Um, I'm trying to think what else. We've also seen, seen in, a lot of in a lot of communities, asking members about the equipment that they use tends to work quite well. Um, and that will vary depending upon the topic that you're in. So sports, it, it, it's obviously a really simple one to answer. But even without sports, um, people usually use some sort of equipment or something they have to buy to, to participate in that topic. So that might be books, that might be videos, there will they're, they're usually be something them, there. And I'll ask members specifically what um, usually gets a good response as well. Nice. So it sounds like a lot of those more personal disclosure types of questions um, people are more excited about answering exactly. first. Um, all right. And Jackie Shelley says that it's a relief not to feel pressure to get a high volume of content at the beginning. Um, but what if she knows in advance that there will be a rush to join and contribute to the community? How can you manage the influx of voices? <laughs> so we have a popular answer and an unpopular answer with this one. The first one would be to say you can't. So to have a, um, a waiting list to join the community. So you build up a lot of anticipation and you make people wait to join it because there's some data that says when people have to wait to join something, they appreciate it more and they're more active as a result. Um, it's along the lines of cognitive dissonance um, theory. So that's one way of doing it. So you can gradually add more and more people in a way that it feels quite exclusive and, and they should be glad that they were able to join. The other way of doing it is by trying to break it down immediately into subgroups. I mean, I haven't heard of that many communities where people rush to join it because typically people don't know what they're missing by not participating in the, in a community. Uh, so we don't have that much experience with that. But what I would say, if you're going to have people rush into join a community, then make sure they have something specific to do there straight away. And it's going to be very difficult to convert a lot of these members into active members of um, of of, of the community because they generally need a significant amount of time and attention and your time is limited to do that. So what you'll find is that a lot of people might, might rush to join it, but I don't think many of them will, will be very active after a couple of months. So I would definitely restrict the number of people that can join and gradually add more and more people in, in a way that lets you convert most of them into active members. That makes a lot of sense. Definitely very nice. Um, and Eileen asks, um, did she hear you say to delete posts that get no activity? She's a bit concerned about removing anything unless it's due to appropriate con inappropriate content. Uh, could you expand on that thought? Sure, I wasn't very clear when I was doing the webinar. So there are two different things here. So there's removing the posts that you have posted that haven't really taken off, that haven't got a, a good response. Um, and that's perfectly fine because you're not selling anyone's feelings there at all except your own. You just know that you posted something that didn't work. If you start removing the posts that members have, have posted, then that's probably a bad thing. So we generally try not to do that because members get upset. What we do instead is move heaven and earth to make sure that when a member posts a discussion that it does get a response. Usually it gets an immediate response from, from, uh, from the community manager in the way where you respond to that discussion, but you also ask a, a question, a, cla a clarifying question that prompts further responses from, from that poster. So instantly you have, you know, um, you responding and then, and then that person responding. So you have three, uh, three posts there, and that looks much better than having nothing whatsoever. So once you have the three, um, other people are likely to join and participate as well, and you can reach out to people and nudge them to participate. Um, so we try, really do try not to remove posts from that, um, that members have, have posted unless they really aren't a good fit. Um, but we are happy to remove our own posts if they haven't really taken off at all. Great. 
And shifting on to uh, more of the kind of evolution of the community, Blake Hall says that you mentioned shifting your activity gradually once you've achieved critical mass from stage one to stage two activities. Uh, which micro level activity would you re recommend shifting to first? So you mean when you move from the inception stage to the establishment stage? I think that's what he's pointing to, yes. Sure, so there's no specific thing. It depends on what your community is lacking at that particular time. If growth is the biggest issue, then you want to perhaps keep the growth high and focus and, and uh, drop down a little bit on initiating those new discussions and prompting people to participate. If, if, it's, the other, if it's the other way around, then obviously it's uh, vice versa. But there's no um, straight answer to that. Typically, what we've found is that growth is easier than activity. It's easier to get people to join and participate once than it is to keep them active in the community. So activity is typically, and I do mean typically, not every time here by any means, but typically um, we spend more time on activity and that is the thing that we um, continue doing. Okay, great. And then Deb wonders about measuring activity per member. Um, she's asking specifically about Ning, so I'll go ahead and take this question. Um, so I can definitely share with you what I've done, and that would be just a stratified sample using Google Analytics data, using Google Analytics and uh, data from the member export, which contains information about last visit. Uh, and then oftentimes I'll actually go to a member profile and see the last time they post and what types of activity they're contributing. So at this point, there's no automated dashboard within Ning or a tool that works specifically with Ning. But the good news is we are developing one. And so for the newer platform, Ning 3.0, uh, in the nearish future, we're, we're looking probably at Q4, Q1 of next year to um, push out a, a dashboard that any network creator or administrator will have access to. And it will have a whole bunch of community health metrics uh, informed a good deal by Richard's input. And then other questions we've seen, you know, the community wants to address and have a bit more detail on. Um, so thanks for your question, Deb. That's a great one. I think people are definitely getting more analytics minded and we look forward to releasing that tool. And then it looks like just one more here um, to wrap it up. Eileen is wondering if you have any examples of successful established communities that have reached and sustained the 90% growth and in activity initiated by community stage. Uh, so communities that are in the establishment stage. So communities that are, I think, uh, reached mitosis, basically, that final stage of 90% of growth and activity is initiated by the community. Uh, well, that will go for nearly every successful community that you see. So the ones that I used here, I think, were um, Whiskey Magazine and Mumsnet. But every community that you see advances through that stage. Every successful com cu uh, community that you typically see advances through that stage. Hold on, let me just find that. Do you think there's a general? For example, advance through that stage. Mums may also advance through that stage. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a general timeline, um, a length of time it takes a community to reach that stage, or does that vary? A, just a whole bunch depending on the type of community. It varies um, less by the type of community and more by the total feasible or audience size. So a community in a very niche or niche to or niche topic generally takes a little bit longer than a community that has a massive potential or audience. Um, and obviously there are very real reasons for that. Um, but what we typically see is that to reach the um, to reach the to reach that critical mass point, generally it takes between three to six months. Uh, to the establishment stage is usually another um, six months to a year. Uh, maturity is anything from one year to three years to reach. 
and then mitosis, I mean, that can be pretty much anything. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Richard. That was another fantastic presentation, and we really appreciate you being here to um, discuss the community life cycle with us. I'd like to also thank all of the community loving folks out there who asked questions today. It does seem like this talk really resonated with a lot of you. Um, I'll be following up with links to the recording of the presentation and a few of the other Ning talks mentioned during this webinar, including converting a newcomer to an active member and the creating content that your community will love. Um, I can also stick in a link to the community management course on Feverbee and um, an additional link to a discussion we'll be hosting in our creators community. If you want to continue the discussion, we'll definitely invite you to chat about your experiences and where your communities lie on the life cycle and how you're going to get them into the next phase. So thanks so much and we hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot. Goodbye everyone.